Well, I'm going to wait and show you the mistake that uh, is there. But as you look at this particular verse, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. If you'd like to add extra notes, I have not mentioned Ephesians uh, 6.10, where it says, Have your feet shod with the the gospel, the readiness of the gospel. uh, uh, It's part of our spiritual warfare to actually be walking with the gospel. Now, a couple things I want to review that we've already covered about what's so good about the good news. We talked about, and there's lots more than what I've covered, but one was the keys of the kingdom, and these are all online. You can go back and, and listen to those if you would like. You can give up without quitting, and this was Peter when, in essence, he said, Lord, you know everything. He gave up, but he didn't quit, and Lord, the Lord brings us sometimes to those moments. We talked about beautiful feet because... Uh, it's different words in both the Old Testament, the prophecy that we read in Isaiah 52, as well as then in Romans. The feet were beautiful in the Old Testament because they fit. They were fitting. They were appropriate for the situation, and the gospel is appropriate for the human condition. And then we said in the New Testament, the word there is actually a word for timing and season. And the analogy that we gave uh, was, you know, Patrick Mahomes, when he's playing, throwing a touchdown pass at the very last second to win the game, and we'd all go, that was beautiful, man. Well, if you were at the game yesterday or watched it, that kick was what? It was beautiful. It was just perfectly timed. Everything that happened the last few seconds of that game was beautiful. And so what's so beautiful about the gospel? It comes perfectly timed, and that's what that word beautiful means. You are enough, and we used... Uh, the story of, of some Bible characters that didn't feel like they were enough, but they were enough for Jesus to die for, and you are all enough to die for. And then we said, your story is enough. That's the woman at the well. Her story was enough. She knew she'd met Jesus. She ran back into town. She shared her story, and the Bible says the whole town uh, came to faith. Your story is enough. And then last week, no more sh- two weeks ago, no more shame, and then... Last week, community. This week is fellowship. Very much related to community, but a slightly different, uh, more of a product or result of community, or perhaps fellowship brings community. But I felt like it was an essential way to conclude. And here is my mistake. I have no idea how Acts 2 shows up everywhere. On the slides, in your notes, it's Acts chapter if you read ahead like, like I would if I was one of you because that's my style, you always said, man, this doesn't make any sense. And I apologized. When, if, I was only one standing up on that last song because I'm, th- I'm sitting there and I am just broken. You know, just, oh, I hate making mistakes. And then Steve's saying, and grace so free. <laughs> that's when I stood up because I felt awful. In fact, I wrote down on my notes too, grace so free, so free. So if you've ever made a mistake, I'm just showing you how free you can be when you've made a mistake. I'm going to be following through the notes very carefully for those that are in the, the, the tech booth. Uh, the, the key statements will be the transitions for the slides. But I remember a long time ago I said, I really want every sermon to be manna, that day's manna, as fresh as possible. Now, in the Bible, on Sabbath, which was actually Saturday, no manna fell, but you got to collect it the day before. Well, I collected some manna uh, the day before. And it's here, I believe it's going to follow and measure along with uh, the sermon this morning, but it, it's fresh. I've got the, the pieces of it here, and, and if we do this right, and I stay cool and calm... It's going to fold right in, and I think it's going to really improve the lesson that Jesus wants to teach us. But I'd like us first to turn to Acts 4, verse 32. Excuse me. It is Acts 2. Give me, well, just erase all that. Okay, I just illustrated it even better, and all that was intent. All of that was intentional. Gee. You know, we've been through some conflict here at the church. Thank you for keeping me. Seriously. Seriously. Okay, here we go. Acts 2, 42 to 47. And this is going to be one whale of a sermon. My, oh, my. And I absolutely love Tim Cole's laugh. All right, here we go, because I am crying inside. 
Verse 42 in Acts 2, and the slides are correct. Don't uncross and put two back. Here we go. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. We're talking about fellowship this morning. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want you to know something. Preachers love this verse. Love that whole section. This is what we dream about. But I want you to write somewhere on the notes or perhaps in your Bible, I really believe that this is descriptive, not prescriptive. In other words, that which is in there, I don't believe that it was often done exactly like that any other place except right there in that time. But it describes Christian fellowship. Does that make sense? You feel the difference between prescriptive and descriptive. Prescriptive would be take two of these every day and you're going to get this result. Now it would be fun if we could do this, but it's not practical. And there's no other place in the Bible where it says you sell everything and give to the poor. There's no other place where it says you live totally communal like that. But you do live in community. And you do live in fellowship. So somewhere in your mind or write it down or in your notes that this is descriptive, not prescriptive. But it doesn't make it any less important. This week, the answer to the questions that we asked last week, if the gospel is such good news, why aren't we sharing it more? Why aren't we making more disciples? Last week, we found an answer in Jesus' community. The church, ecclesia, becoming Jesus' witnessing body, reclaiming its story, believers sharing their individual stories of how they met Jesus, believed the good news of the gospel, and decided to become a disciple. Now, that is not to denigrate Bible study afterwards. But I, I made a point of pointing out that those original situations that popped up in the early days of the church were coming from story before the New Testament was written. Of Obviously, Bible study and scripture study, all of that becomes into play. But it begins with story. And this week, then, the answer to this question will be anchored in the New Testament Greek word, Koinonia. But I think it pops up enough in our English language. We have Koinonia Coffee Shop. We have Koinonia T-Shirt Company. We have Koinonia uh, uh, Care Centers. This word pops up in English, and it means fellowship. Most often translated fellowship. And Acts 2, 42 to 47, not Acts 4, describes aspects of fellowship that was experienced in and around the early church. I have jotted down some questions that aren't in your notes, but they're relevant. The early church avoided both isolationism and accommodation. Do you notice that? They did what church people do. They worshiped God. They were obviously praying for miracles, and they were getting miracles. They, they, they did what churches do. They didn't accommodate, and they didn't isolate. And so I wrote down in my notes, for me, how? How is it that they avoided isolationism? Because it says that people are joining them every day. And they did not accommodate, they did what church people do. The early church thrived amid secularism or hyper-religion because of the Jewish culture. So they had the Greeks, very secular, uh, also, you know, worshiping other gods. I mean, a very anti-cultural situation. They thrived in that, and we, you and I, by and large, as evangelicals in America today, we feel threatened by it. So I asked the question myself, why? The early church thrived among secularism or hyper-religion or paganism. We seem threatened by it. Why? I don't have a great answer, but I'm going to give you some, and I think we can come up with some biblically. Jesus was the orient, 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 orienting center of the church. Discipleship was the direct result of the lordship of Christ. It was the direct result of Jesus coming out of the grave, and that impacted them. 
And so Jesus became the oriented center of everything. And so they didn't feel like they needed to apologize for what they were doing. So it must have been the way that they were doing what church people do. So part of our challenge today is that when you talk about fellowship, we know what we do as believers, but are we doing it the way we ought to be doing it? I've always been humbled, and just I think this is in your notes. I've always been humbled and intrigued and fascinated and frankly turned a little upside down by this statement that believers enjoyed the favor of all the people. Do you know what the word there is? It's charis. You know what Jesus gave you when you got saved? Charis, grace. How in the world? Do you understand? Does, does this not tune you up on your head? The world was giving the church grace. Do you feel that right now? Do you, I mean, sir, do you feel any grace from this world? I feel, they, they feel like we're judging them, and so they're judging us, and we just take our toys on both sides, and this void exists. If that doesn't turn you upside down, it, 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 it rips at me. How in the world? The world was giving them favor. That's our job. I think that they were, and that's why the world was returning it. What could the early church have been doing that caused such a favorable environment? I'm going to show you a clip. I know we're not from England, and maybe you don't read the tabloids. Maybe you don't pay that close attention. But this is about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And there is a mistake in your notes. Her first name has an H in it. Do you know, you know a bit of their story? We're going to show it because I want you to see this very short clip of this question that an interviewer asks her. Now, if, if you... Pay attention to that, or especially if you were in England, I mean, let's face it, the royal family is way up here, and yet they're just folk. They're just folk. And, and, you know, Prince Harry's mother died running away from paparazzi, and now he's always followed by it. And then he's married a movie star from America, Meghan Markle. She kept her name, and so we know all about her, don't we? Well, we don't know all about her. And this man's going to ask her a question, and you're going to see her countenance notably change when she gets vulnerable. And we've been talking about connection and community, and you, you, I, I just see in, her que in the question that this man asks, her vulnerability, then her honesty, and when I, well, every time I watch this, I want to invite her to Bunko Night with, with you ladies. I just do. Oh, come on. Megan, join us. Join them for Bunko. Or come, you know what? Wear your grubbies and wrap gifts with us with Operation Christmas Child on Sunday. Please. Just, you know, just, I prom we won't even ask you, don't, don't, we won't ask you anything about the palace. Just, just be you. And I'm wondering if somehow the kindness of the early church showed, maybe with their questions, when they would ask how are you, really? She actually decides to answer it. And we've said this. If you've watched the Brene Brown videos, we've said this. She asked the question in the early uh, part of one of her talks. How many of you believe that vulnerability is a sign of weakness? And the whole crowd raises their hands. Then she says, do you realize every person that spoke in front of me has been vulnerable? How many of you thought those were courageous people? And the whole crowd raised their hands. And so what we've got to do, we've got to figure out what's going on inside of us that makes us afraid to be vulnerable. Because I think fellowship happened because of that. And perhaps it's with a great question that we can show that we care. We can create an atmosphere that maybe happened in the book of Acts chapter 2. Just take a look at this and watch her countenance as it changes. It began with such joy. On the public stage, Meghan seemed to embrace her new royal role with confidence. I am here with you as a mother, as a wife, as a woman of color, and as your sister. But backstage, coping with the glare of intense media scrutiny while dealing with the everyday pressures of motherhood is clearly taking its toll. In an ITV documentary, we see, for the first time, the extent of her fragility. I don't know what the impact on your physical and mental health of all the pressure that you clearly feel under. Um, 
I would say, look, any woman when they're, especially when they're pregnant, you're really vulnerable. And so that was made really challenging. And then when you have a newborn, you know. You, mm-hmm. It's but, a long time ago, but I remember, yeah. yeah. You know, as, and especially as a woman, it's really, it's a lot. So you add this on top of just trying to be a new mom or trying to be a newlywed. It's, um, yeah, well, I guess, and also thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm okay. But it's, uh, it's a very real thing to be going through behind the scenes. And the answer is, would it be fair to say not really okay? Since it's really been a struggle. Yes. Does that do the same thing to any of you that it does to me? I, ho- I hope that it does. I- <laughs> Questions convey our care. And listening to others, listening then really conveys our care I don't know don't you just want to put your arm around her and how many people in our world are like that how many people in this world right here are like that Uh, uh, the elders and Steve and Keith and I went through some training this weekend on crucial conversations those kinds of things and there was a phrase that I heard and I wrote it down I told the guys that I was going to say the phrase this morning we learned about the otherness of others I want to write that phrase down, the otherness of others. In other words, their, their, their situations matter. Their situations count. And I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that Acts 2, 42 to 47 is describing a kind of fellowship where people counted. And I'm not going to suggest that they've never counted in my life or in your life or in this church's life But if, if it's true, which it has to be because the research is showing it, that loneliness, for instance, the loss of connectedness in our culture, if disconnectedness relationally is the number one health hazard in America right now, so much of a health hazard that the insurance companies are warning us about it, m- more detrimental to our health than 15 cigarettes a day is what the research shows. Loneliness more detrimental to our health than obesity, alcoholism. There should be no better place than in the fellowship of the church community for those connections to happen. And I'm going to suggest it begins with the questions that we ask. In my notes, again, this is me, this is manna, a sincere respect of humanity, of all things human. She has an unlimited expense account. There's nothing that if she needs, she could buy. Does she look happy to you? So the rest of us that can't do that, do we look happy to you? You know what I'm saying? The otherness of others. Seeing people in their full humanity. Treating people as people. I told a joke the other night that was funny to everybody in that room and they laughed and it came by way of a Christian woman I thought because she was a woman who shared it it was appropriate but in hindsight I would have never told that joke or that story with an unchurched person in the space I wouldn't and if I would have I shouldn't have and I've repented before the Lord for that Because that doesn't convey the kind of fellowship that apparently was active in the church. That gave favor from the world back to the church. You're being quiet. I hope that we're hearing. Today's big idea is this. Jesus' church, his witnessing, fellowshipping community, all expressed by the words koinonia, fellowship, is the result of discipleship not the cause. So it begins with Jesus being our orienting center. Discipleship begins with you and I becoming learners of Christ. Let's pretend this is Jesus. And so he's my orienting center. So everything I'm doing revolves around Jesus. Because disciple means learner of, follower of. And so he's the master and I'm learning from him. 
And next week we're going to do a one standalone sermon that's going to talk about how Jesus related to the Father, the world, and, and, and the church. And we're going to try to mirror that. It's just going to be a one sermon standalone, but I think it'll dovetail into this. So it, it, it's all, everything that happens as a result is, is the result of our discipleship. And that's why we're emphasizing making disciples right now. Now, this might need to be an apology too, but it's a good apology, and it's a healthy apology. Many church leaders, probably me and some things that I've said unintentionally because I don't believe it, but I probably insinuated it, many church leaders relate how low church attendance is the reason behind the lack of disciple making. And so if you did the Sermon to Life last week, you noticed the quote by Gordon MacDonald. I've been saying two Sundays a month is average attendance for a believer. He said, he's the chancellor of Denver Theological Seminary, he said the survey shows 1.8. 1.8 times a month is when a believer attends a worship service on Sunday morning. That's what he said. And so the goal then is to get more bodies in the chairs, right? That way we'll have more disciples, right? No. Ever. That's not even the way Jesus said to do it. It's just not the way Jesus said to do it. And I believe we're still following straight through in the notes. There are many reasons, some good, some not so good, for drops in Sunday morning attendance. When it comes to the not so good reasons for drops in attendance, those numbers are more of a symptom than a cause. I'm not going to unpack that a bunch. When it comes to disciple making, the value of fellowship is underappreciated, but consider our schedules. I told the story a couple weeks ago, I used the example. You know, someone gets hurt on the way home from church, you, get, you rush your child to the hospital after church, and there's no doctors, there's no nurses, there's nobody there. Where's everybody at? Well, they went to church this morning, because the pastor said they're supposed to. They'll be here in a minute, they stop for lunch. But see, no one's there to serve them for lunch because they went to church. And the hypocrisy of that within us Christians is amazing. And worst of all, we preachers. Worst, well, am I making the point? You're all so quiet, but I think I'm making the point. (laughs) Does Scripture ever infer I'm not giving anybody an out. I'm trying to preach biblically this morning. I am, I am, I'm trying to be biblical this morning. Does Scripture ever infer Sunday worship equates to being a disciple? Not one place. We need to create alternative disciple-making opportunities then, don't we? I mean, Friday, we're going to go see the Newsboys. Them going to drive directly from Topeka to Kearney, Nebraska. I've got a motel room waiting for me. I'll probably get there about 4.30 in the morning. Sleep for a couple hours for a 9 a.m. meeting. I'll be there all day in Kearney. I'm going to come back. We get an hour. We get an, extra, we get an hour. That's good. And I'll be here Sunday morning. I promise I'll be ready to go. And I've been looking forward to that because that's my personality. But if you did that and you didn't come on Sunday morning, I will tell you, total grace. Because actually what I'm, this whole week actually I was getting excited about how busy I was going to be. And I'm realizing how insane that is. Just, uh, who does that except crazy Americans? Does Jesus' community need a wake-up call about fellowshipping more often with believers? Of course they do. But, but as I said, shaming is so effectively in a sh- ineffective for making disciples, Right? Shame, shame doesn't, isn't a good way to parent. It's certainly not a good way for churches to make disciples. This is because Jesus taught disciple-making as his operating system. He said, I will build my church. That's my job. Your job is to make disciples. Didn't he say that very plainly? Matthew 28, go ye therefore and make disciples of all men. He didn't say, go and build my church. He said, go make disciples. If you make disciples, you will always, 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 always have a church. If you try to create an institutional church, you probably won't end up with very many disciples. That's why we're emphasizing disciple making. And frankly, I think we've got more disciples here, even though we sometimes don't have that many church attenders. And, it would, and it's so wrong for us to judge people who aren't here thinking, you know, if they were here more often, they would probably be more like Jesus. All of you that never miss, 
are you where you want to be with Jesus right now? And you don't miss church. So apparently there's something else that's going on. I think we find it in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. We need to find a way, even as a local body, to pull in the day-to-day -day part. We just have to. We absolutely have to. And in fact, I've got, I'm getting an advisory team together to start talking about how can we create this day-to-day -day connectedness and not forget that it's happening all the time anyway. There are hundreds of conversations in this church every week via text, Instagram, Facebook, phone calls of relational conversations with people. Hundreds of those every week. We know that. We, we know there is. So there is this day-to-day -day connectedness we need to think about in terms of making disciples. So that we're redeeming all of these moments because we don't have that much time. Our schedules are so jammed. And so rather than trying to find, we got, I got to get a balanced life. Well, I was talking to my daughter, Sarah, who's an HR uh, 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 director. She said, we're not using the word work-life balance, work balance anymore. We're talking about work-life integration. And if you're thinking about Acts chapter 2, that's exactly what you read about. Is, is work and life and living just integrated. Everything's folded in. It says day to day they were doing that. It's probably important for me to uh, point out some, some verses at this point that, uh, uh, that mirror this new community of fellowship. So it's in your notes. Let's look closely at what's going on in and around Jesus' community of fellowship. Excuse me, I want to, like I said, we're bringing manna from, and so I'm a little, I don't want to get out of order. Here we go. Uh, where it says, biblical examples of koinonia include, you find that? So the first one I have is Christ's sharing of his body and blood is represented by the blood, the bread, and the cup in the Lord's Supper. Where you read there, is it, is, is the body, is the, is the, the cup that Jesus gave us and the bread that Jesus gave us in this particular place, it's 1 Corinthians 10, 16. You might want to write that down. He used the word participation. It's not the participation that you have in this cup and in this bread, not the Lord's body. And that's the word koinonia there in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. That's why we call communion, the Lord's Supper, communion. It's because it's a fellowship. It's Jesus sharing with us, us sharing with each other, and that's koinonia. That's fellowship. That's one example. Biblical examples of koinonia include communion, the sharing of his broken body, his shed blood with us, and us distributing it one to another, and that's why communion is called communion, because it's this word koinonia. Then the giving of offerings, and I've underlined in your notes, it's underlined every time these words are used, it is also the word koinonia. And so the giving, underline, and distribution, underline, of financial contributions, all of those words in the Bible are koinonia. All of those words. And so I've got examples, biblical examples. If we had time, I would read all of those. But every place where giving, distribution, and contribution appears, it's the same word, koinonia. That's why I felt like this was a really important word to look at because there's community, but then koinonia builds from that, and then koinonia also then gives back into community. It'd be like us buying our Hot Wheels and bringing them on next Sunday. Uh, that, that's part of the process of just contributing. We're fellowshipping when we're doing that. Participating in the activities of the Holy Spirit. That's koinonia again. And, and the biblical verse that we could look at for that is 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And then the practical events, effects of being a community united in Christ. And one of your take-home sermon to life that I've got in, in the Sermon to Life is 1 John 1, 3, where it says, this is not the fellowship that you and I have, the fellowship that we have with the Lord Jesus. So it's this common caring. I'm in fellowship with Jesus. I, I hate making the pulpit Jesus, but I'm in fellowship with Jesus, and you're in fellowship with Jesus, and because of that, we're in fellowship together. We're in relationship together. And it seems very clear to me that in the early church, that birthed, incredible, incredible things, things that you, most of us pray for all the time would happen in the body of Christ. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, koinonia, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and that's the Lord's Supper. 
praying. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So Jesus was clearly in the midst of that. Actively, visibly working. Doing things, miracles, signs, and wonders in the midst. It might very well because the church was revolving around Jesus. He was honoring them with those. Sometimes we ask, this, why isn't anything happening? Well, maybe Jesus at this moment isn't our orientating center. We're trying to do it all by ourselves. We're trying to create church. You, 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 unless you've ever done it, you, you, you can't imagine what it's like for a pastor and a worship leader to try to create a Sunday morning experience knowing that if I, based on what I've already said, it's not even a biblical goal that Jesus even articulated. It's just not. The, the, the goal that Jesus articulated was make disciples of all nations, then gather as that community called the church. I will tell you this, the gates of hell, the, Jesus, the, the church that Jesus said would not uh, be overcome by the gates of hell, was a church of disciples. He wasn't talking about an institution or this building. He was like, you and I as disciples, that's the church that the gates of hell would not prevail against. It would be a church of disciples, of Christ's followers, people whose life they're orienting center daily, not just on Sunday. And I don't think we teach that here, but, but it, there, it's subtle inside of us. It is subtle inside of us. I know it's, more than subtle inside of preachers. I mean, that's how we're measured. Start measuring ourselves as how many disciples do we have? How many people are sincerely trying to follow Christ? And how many venues and opportunities do we have for them to do that? That's why we really want everyone here. We're, we don't, we're going to stop letting you fly under the relational radar. We're just, we're just going to try to stop that. We're, we're going to try to get everybody connected so that you're known and that you know others. So that nobody ever gets sick and we don't know about it. No one ever goes through a hard time and we don't know about it. And we're, we're going to be comfortable when we ask the question to the Meghan Markles that we're going to in, get involved with. And they suddenly show that they're vulnerable and we don't freak out. Well, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. No, you know what? Probably the smartest answer says, wow, it's, that's really bad, isn't it? You know. But don't do what Brene Brown talks about. Want a sandwich? Remember, remember that video? No, keep listening. And keep caring. And all of a sudden, I think, this favor <laughs> that Jesus gave the early church as they're giving that favor out to others, read it again. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. That haunts me. You understand what it, it says? The, these are the unchurched. These are the unbelievers. Now, probably in this context, mainly Jews. The, the gospel really hadn't gone to the Gentile community yet, which which is even more bizarre in a way because it was Jews that crucified Jesus. It really wasn't the Romans. They just were the lackeys for the Jews. And those same people that had crucified Jesus is now showing favor to that same community? You're hearing me. Shared meals in each other's homes, a, a joy that was distinct from the mixed fleeting happiness that comes from the world. God's being praised. Believers enjoying favor and grace from outsiders. This should turn us upside down and inside out. Fa and these are my notes. Favor and grace from outsiders, question mark, exclamation point, question mark. Seriously? How? Seriously? Oh God, posture us. Oh God, posture us in that way. Apparently the unchurched liked this message that the community was sharing. Not only their message, they seemed to benefit from the methods of it. Converts being added daily, in my notes I go, no wonder. <laughs> I want that too. We yearn for fellowship. 
These are under my personal thoughts. We yearn for fellowship and communal benefits like these, but resist its demands. I get that. I get that. Boy, I would love this Acts 2, 42 to 47, but wow, seriously, I got to give everything? We're already overwhelmed. Anyone here not overwhelmed periodically? How do we do all that? I was reading an article that Diana Bass wrote. She's a speaker. She speaks in churches and parachurch groups. And she said, you know, when I go around America and I'm talking to Christians, contrary to what we're told, I'm not seeing fear. I'm not hearing anger. I'm witnessing exhaustion. And it goes back to instead of trying to find balance, which just wear us out, we've got to integrate Jesus as disciples, as his disciples, as the orientating center of everything that we do. Throughout this idea of balance, it's integration. It's, we need to find the day-to-day stuff, the day-to-day. And that, that day-to-day then becomes far less about our performances It becomes very much about being real with each other. With the only agenda being Jesus as the orientating center of our lives. I think these are in your notes. Reflect for a moment on Meghan Markle's smile when the reporter asked how she was doing. Thank you for asking. Not many people do. This was on a slide a while back, but the Fred Rogers movie, Mr. Rogers is going to come out soon, and I think we'll all want to see it. This is what he said on humanities and things that value. Have we somehow, as, and I know now we're going long, I'm sorry. On humanities and things that value, As human beings, our job in life is to help people realize how rare and valuable each one of us really is. That each of us has something that no one else has or ever will have. Something inside that is unique to all time. It's our job to encourage each other to discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. I think that's a gospel, part of the gospel. Another quote from him I shared this yesterday as we were meeting. Love isn't a state of perfect caring. It's an active noun-like struggle. I think that's what was going on in the early church. Love isn't a state of perfect caring. It's an active noun-like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and now. That attitude will bring favor back to us. Tell us more. Tell me more. I want to know more. And I'm going to close with a challenge that Jesus has been giving me. If CCC, this is in your notes, and I am closing. If CCC, that's us, Christ Community Church, a church of disciples, is going to enjoy the favor of the unchurched in Lawrence and Douglas County, What's got to change about us? The cool thing is we don't have to stop being Acts 2, 42 to 47. This is heavy-duty church stuff. This is praise and worship. This is praying powerfully. And these are people whose story begins with, I repented and believed. So we're not taking repentance out either. Okay? So we're not separating from culture, and we're not accommodating culture. We are doing and being what church folk do because that's what they did they didn't change anything to accommodate anybody they did what church folks do so it had to have been how they were doing it not what they were doing does that make sense the answers to this these questions may sting but i think if we humble ourselves to hear jesus's answer we will become a disciple making community for me jesus has asked has answered this question with another question. I I think this is in your notes. Jeff, what if you could see people's differences as as interesting and inviting conversation rather than dividing? If you're in my generation and you've been a Christian for a long time, probably here's what's happened to you. 
when it comes to love and, and making and relationships and truth, my generation was taught it's truth, baby. It's all about truth. Well, the minute I do that, what's it do? It isolates me, doesn't it? I was taught it's all about truth. It's always about truth. It is. But what's the Bible say? Truth and love in relationships. So rather than letting my desire for truth to drive me away from relationship, let my desire to love with truth bring me into relationships. That's a disciple-making community. That's Acts 2, 42 to 47. I'm absolutely convinced. We need ways of navigating our differences. I don't think this is in your notes. Like I said, this is just manna that God was given me. We need ways of navigating our differences that deepen our curiosity. I don't think we're that curious about the unchurched right now. I just don't think we are. And we need to be, we need our curiosity deepened. We need to deepen our friendships. We need to deepen our capacity to disagree agreeably. We've got to deepen the argument that every human is loved and valued by God. What was the tenet of that one sermon? You are enough. And surely you didn't hear me say you're enough just because of you. No, you are enough that Jesus had to die for you. That's the gospel message. Because there will be that crisis of belief for people. And we know later on in the book of Acts, it did change. I mean, the world decided maybe they weren't as interested. But the church didn't change. The world just began to start saying no to it. But it began well. And I think we can return to that. Because I want to become a disciple-making community. I do. I do. I think we all do. I think that's what we've been praying about. And that's what we've all been frustrated about. And it begins with Jesus just becoming the orientating center of our lives. That's the life of a a disciple. And that that is a life that is enjoying such intense fellowship one with another and with Jesus. That people say, what is going on with y'all? Because I I need that. I am just lonely. I am just disconnected. Let's pray.